Let's say, though, you could hire LeBron James to come in and substitute for you and play that college player one-on-one. Now who's going to win? Why would you ever put yourself in a position where you're going up against somebody who knows more than you do when you could put somebody in there who knows more than they do? This is The Fighting Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to entrepreneurs looking to change the world. Learn how to start, build, and scale a business in today's highly competitive business environment. Here's your host, The Fighting Entrepreneur, Anik Singhal. What's up, you crazy fighting entrepreneurs? It is Anik Singhal, your host for The Fighting Entrepreneur, your favorite person in the world, back with an episode that's going to save you and make you a ton of freaking money. I've got the esteemed honor of bringing on a man who's saved me millions. And I don't just say that lightly. Okay. I say that with full confidence. I'm telling you, the only thing that burns a hole in me is that I wish I had met him three to four years before I did, because I swear I lost, I estimate about four, maybe $5 million that are not in my pocket now because I didn't know Tom. All right. So with that said, um, today's episode is going to be 10 ways for entrepreneurs to save money on taxes. I am bringing to you who I believe to be the number one tax expert in the world. That's right. I said in the world, this guy goes around speaking in like Kazakhstan and stuff. So he knows tax code. Um, he's just a great guy. Uh, and he's always been I mean, he's such a busy person. He's the tax advisor and he's also a rich dad advisor. So he's a main advisor to Robert Kiyosaki. So he's working with the celebrities of celebrities. Yet every time I text him, whether it's six in the morning or 10 at night, I don't know how he gets back to me within three minutes. That's just the kind of person he is. So he's a good dear friend, a brilliant entrepreneur. He's out there saving people money. The biggest mistake you could make today is not listen to him. That's honest to God, the biggest mistake you could make. So I'm really, really excited to have on um, my good friend, Tom Wheelwright. Tom, thanks for being here with us, man. Hey, thanks for having me on it. Always good to be with you. Always good. I appreciate that. Um, we were joking earlier um, just to give you guys kind of, you know, the impact that Tom has on his clients because you heard me. I'm singing his praises. The, the bottom line is this. You save someone millions of dollars, they're going to sing your praises. Like it's just how it, <laughs> it's, it's just how it works out. I was at an event recently and the joke I was just telling Tom is, and maybe Brad Sumrock will listen to this. Maybe we'll clip this out, Tom, and send it to Brad. Maybe he'll laugh. Um, I was at an event for Brad Sumrock, a multifamily real estate uh, event. And very early on, Brad spoke about Tom and how Tom has helped him save so much money. And um, and, and then he just he, he just kept talking about Tom. Like his name kept coming up again and again and again. And I made a you know, I had a joke with my wife. I said, man, next time I come to Brad's event, I'm going to bring a bottle of vodka. And every time he says, Tom, I'm going to take a shot. And by 11 a.m. on day one, I'm going to be damn out. But she turns around and said something very funny. She goes, I know you think that's funny, but you talk about Tom just as much, just FYI. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, you know what? It makes sense. You save someone so much money, they'll talk about you. It makes total sense. Uh, listen, before we get started, are you a member of Learn Nation? Come on, get over to lurn.com, get a free account. Listen, we're going to put 10 million entrepreneurs into this self-delivered platform. We are building a massive community, a movement worldwide of entrepreneurs, because I believe very confidently that if we want to change the world, if you want to cure world poverty, if you want to bring education to every child, you want to solve, you know, you want to bring peace to the world? It's not going to be governments. It's going to be entrepreneurs who do it. It always has been. So you can either be a part of our movement, go get your free account at lurn.com, or you can sit aside and watch us move by you. Don't do that, all right? So go to learn.com right now. If you're listening to this on iTunes, make sure to leave us a great review. Go to Anik Podcast, A-N-I-K Podcast.com for all of our show notes. And if you're on YouTube, come on. You got to share this out. You got to hit subscribe, leave a comment, click the little bell thingy, click the little thumbs up icon and give Tom a shout out, man. He's taking time away from his personal life, his business to be here today to teach us. It's a complete, complete honor. Tom, thanks again. Tom, you know what? Before we get into the rounds, because you have 10 specific strategies you're going to share with us today that aren't heard about, you know, common stuff that's all over the place. How the heck did you fall in love with taxes? Like, why, why do you like taxes so much, Tom? It's, it's not a common trait for people. <laughs> well, you know, um, uh, Einstein said that the most difficult thing in the world to understand is income tax. And I thought, well, if I can, if I can master something that Einstein uh, had trouble with, I, I'm, I'm probably doing okay. Actually, I love taxes because to me, it's a game. 
and I love games. I, I grew up playing uh, gin rummy and hearts, you know, with my mother and poker and with my buddies. And I just, I love games. I love games and, and taxes, like you said, it is the number one expense that anybody has. And it's actually the number one pain most people have financially because um, a tax dollar saved has an emotional benefit to it as well as a tangible benefit to it. And people hate paying taxes because they don't see the money being used, you know, the way they want it to be used. And so they hate paying taxes, which is actually why the tax law has evolved the way it has um, in, into a series of incentives, right? Because the government figured out many years ago, back in the 60s, that, uh, primarily, that people hate paying taxes. And, a, and if they can give an ins, a tax incentive, it's actually worth more to the person than a direct subsidy. So that's why the tax law is basically a whole 6,000 pages of incentives. And that's really what it is. It's prim and primarily for entrepreneurs. And so here's the crazy part. And we're going to have you back uh, for another episode. You and I already talked about it for a Freedom Friday episode. Because see, when you say that, there's going to be a class of people that say, here we go, another conservative, doesn't want to pay taxes. But what I learned from you on the first call we ever had, which was a big breakthrough call for me, is what you said was, listen, not paying taxes is not evil. As a matter of fact, using the tax code to benefit, you know, to benefit yourself by not having to pay taxes, you end up having to do things, make investments in things that end up benefiting the economy and the government far greater than what your tax dollars could have. So it's a true win, win, win. And so it's easy to believe the narrative that the politicians like to put out there, which is not paying taxes is evil. But if you start to truly understand it, it changes your paradigm. And I don't want to get into that in this episode because that will be a Freedom Friday episode. But um, I, I, I just love the fact that you have figured it out and, and made it so that us entrepreneurs who work our butts off, right? Like we work hard. I work hard. Um, and, and at the end, I should keep more of my money and you, you know, and at the same time though, I want to do good in the world. I mean, I give a lot and it's important to me that I give a lot. And most entrepreneurs are not selfish. They like to give up, give back a lot. But if I can give back a lot and impact people while also impacting myself positively, that's a win, win, win. You said something else, Tom, that really hit with me. And you said the emotional benefit of saving a dollar on taxes is so much more than than earning another dollar. Um, but think about this, right? You taught me this also. A dollar saved, then earning you cumulative interest for the next 30 to 40 years is not a dollar anymore. It's it's tens, if not hundreds of dollars. And again, where does that money go? You either spend it, which impacts the economy. You invest it in property, which impacts the economy. So it's really amazing stuff. Um, it's really amazing stuff. That's why I'm very excited for the entrepreneurs listening right now. We're going to give you 10 ways to save money um, and to save taxes. But Tom, we do have a tradition here at The Fighting Entrepreneur, which involves you raising your right hand. So if you can follow along, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Tom Wheelwright. I, Tom Wheelwright. Do solemnly swear. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth to tell the truth and nothing but the truth and reveal the tax strategies of the rich and reveal the tax strategies of the rich. I love it. Sweet. Awesome. Um, let's do it, man. Let's move into round number one, which will be strategy number one. Let's dive in. Tom, what's your first strategy for our entrepreneurs to hear? Well, I, I think number one is to recognize that any expense you have can be deductible, okay? So it, what we have to remember is that the tax law, you are taxed on your net income, okay? It's a net income tax. Now for, for employees, it's not. It's a gross income tax because you're taxed on every dollar you earn. But for entrepreneurs, it's a net income tax, meaning that you earn the income, but any money that you spend back into your business, that you put back into your business, and as long as we meet certain tests, can be deductible, meaning that it reduces your taxes by whatever your tax rate is. So you earn a dollar of income as an employee, you're gonna pay, and you're in a 40% tax bracket, you're gonna pay 40 cents on that dollar of income. But as an entrepreneur, 
if you earn a dollar of income and then you have a dollar of expenses, you're going to pay zero taxes on that income because you use the money in the business. See, this goes back to our, you know, uh, Freedom Friday uh, comment, which is, you know, you, you have understanding that the government wants you to put your money back into your business. So then the question is, okay, so what does that mean? So what I get all the time is people will ask me, Tom, is this deductible? Is this deductible? And I want to help you rephrase the question. Okay. I think one of the things that entrepreneurs do really well is they come up with better questions and the better entrepreneurs come up with the best questions, right? And the question instead of, is this deductible is how do I make this deductible? And so there are four primary tests, and this is very important for everybody to understand. The first test is that the expense, there has to be a business purpose for the expense. And that's a pretty easy test to meet. That means there's some reason, business reason, that you're spending the money. But the next two tests are, are, are a little more difficult. The next one is it must be ordinary, meaning it's typical in your business. So let me give you an example. So... <clears throat> Let's say an insurance agent takes his best client to um, Hawaii because they're they're spending a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollars in premiums um, a year, and so they take their best client to Las Vegas for a weekend in Las Vegas. That would be pr actually pretty typical, I find, among you know high high uh, earning insurance agents. They're going to do that kind of stuff. That's a that's a sales technique that that they do all the time. If your accountant takes you to Las Vegas, that's probably not typical for your accountant. Okay, it's remembering that CPA stands for cheapest people in America. <laughs> that it's. <laughs> I was just going to say, come on, Tom, let's go to Vegas. Let's do it. <laughs> that's not typical. Okay, so it would not be an ordinary. It wouldn't be a typical expense for me, but it might be a typical expense for you. Okay. And then the third one is it's got to be necessary. And this is the most important one. This means that it's the, the purpose of the expense is to make you more money, right? That's the purpose of the expense. And here's what's great about, I think, about the tax law. If you meet those first three tests, in other words, there's a business purpose, it's a typical or ordinary expense in your business, and it's going to make you more money. What's really going to be the outcome of spending that money? It's not that the, the outcome isn't going to be just that you reduce taxes. The outcome is going to be that you make more money. So the tax law actually encourages you, if you follow the tax law, you'll end up actually making more money than if you don't follow the tax law because the tax law is actually there incentivizing you and giving you the instructions on how to make more money. Because the fourth, the fourth item is very important, and that's documentation. Well, Annika, you've got to have seen, you've seen thousands of entrepreneurs and you know that one of the things they struggle with the most is documenting their expenses and whether that's in their bookkeeping or whether that's having receipts or whatever. But you also know that documentation is a really important part of business. Okay. If you can't document it, then it, it's not real. And, and if you think about the IRS, by the way, the IRS, if, if you pretend to document it, they will pretend to give you a deduction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, the, the very first thing the IRS will look at, if they audit you, is your documentation. So you've got to document that, and it's a real receipt. By the way, your credit card statement does not do it for you. It's got to be an actual receipt, and you're going to write on the receipt. You know, for example, let's, let's give a big one. So one of the, the big deductions that people miss is meals. Okay, it's a huge deduction. I like you and I have talked about this one. Um, it's meals. You take, you, you, for example, you go to dinner, say once a week, because we want it to be ordinary, right? Typical. Once a week, you take somebody to dinner to discuss business. Well, let's say that that person you're taking to dinner is your spouse. Okay, but you're going to use that spouse as a sounding board, as somebody who's going to give you feedback that you might not otherwise get from an employee or somebody else. Okay, well, does that meet the test? Is there a business purpose? Yes. Is it, is it typical that you might once a week take somebody to, you know, go to dinner with somebody or a lunch or whatever and actually in a casual restaurant setting get some of that feedback that you need? Yeah, of course, that's typical. Is it necessary? Is it going to make you money? Well, yeah, that's, that's the whole point of the conversation is to make you money. And then you just document it. 
Okay, so that's a really good example. Meals is a big one that people miss because they don't, they're not focused on what the meal's about. They're focused on, you know, they go and have a good time and they, they you know, they have a drink and all that. And that's fine. Just understand that if you don't have that business conversation, if that's not the purpose of the meal, it's not deductible. And if you want to have meals that aren't deductible, that's fine. But recognize that they could be deductible, right? So what can I do to make it deductible? And that's that's the key. So meals is a big one. So another big deduction, I think the biggest deduction people miss, um, in my experience, is home office. Okay, so let's go. So is on. this, are we moving on to strategy number two? We are. Number two would, would, would be home office. So home office is a big one. And it, it's a deduction. Okay, it's specifically allowed in the tax law. And it's got very specific requirements. Okay, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of the requirements. One, one of the big ones is it has to be an area in your home that is used for nothing but your home office. So don't put a bed in there. I mean, I'll tell you, I'm actually recording right now from a room that is not qualified to be a home office. It has a bed in it, okay? It has my, my grandson's crib in it. Um, this is not qualified. So I don't take this space, even though I record in here, I don't take this space as a home office. I do have other space that is just for home office, and that's what I take for my home office. So understand, it has to be only used for business. And that's an important one. The IRS will ask you that. But what I get a lot is um, I get a lot of people telling me that their accountant told them not to take the home office deduction because it raises a red flag. And what that, if you ever get told that, it means that it's time for a new tax preparer. Because if you do it right, the, the home office has not been a red, red flag for over 20 years. Okay. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it was absolutely a red flag. But today, what the red flag is, when you, when you have to disclose that you have a home office is when you're on a Schedule C. Now, a Schedule C, meaning that you're a sole proprietor, is a red flag, but it's the Schedule C that's the red flag, okay? The home office is just a secondary red flag because you, and the only reason you disclose it is because you have a Schedule C. So having that Schedule C is just, it's, it's bad. You have a five times greater chance of being audited with a Schedule C than without a Schedule C. So there's your red flag right there. And, and, and that basically, by the way, that's, that's strategy number three, but we're going to come back to strategy number two. Strategy number three is you never have a Schedule C. Um, <laughs> what, I, I, okay, uh, are we ready to talk about that or you want to come back? No, let's go back to home office because okay. home office um, actually is, is a much bigger deal than people think it is. You know, the other thing the accountant will say is, well, you know, it's really not that much. Well, okay, let's say, for example, that you have 10, 10 rooms in your home and one of them is a home office. That means that you're going to be able to deduct one-tenth or 10% of everything you spend on, basically everything you spend on your home. So your maintenance, your cleaning, your um, utilities, um, now, um, mortgage interest is not as deductible as it used to be. Taxes are not as deductible as they used to be. All of these things, if they're in your home office, now they're deductible, okay? Because there aren't the limitations, right, the, on, on business taxes. Business taxes don't have the same limitation as personal taxes. So you have all of these benefits, but here's the big one. And <laughs> this is one nobody ever gets. So cars, right, people don't deduct enough of their cars, and here's why, because they don't have a home office. So we're going to connect the two here. So the very first trip you take during the day, let's say you go from your home um, and you go see a client. That's considered a commute, so that's non-deductible. And then you go see clients all during the day, and you come home at night, and that last trip home is a commute. So what that means is probably 40 to 50% of your travel during the day is that commute to and from either a client or an outside office or something like that. All right. So that means you, that let's say your car is now right now is 50% deductible because you only use it for 50% business because the rest of the time it's commuting, right? Now, all of a sudden you have a home office. All right. Every morning you go to your home office and you commute 30 feet. 
<laughs> I love it. And then your very first trip out to that first client is no longer a commute. When you come back, you come back to your home office. You then commute 30 feet from your home office to your kitchen. So here's the thing. This is in the IRS instructions on home office. They actually talk about this, that by having that, by having a home office, you, and you have to use it, right? Okay, so you're actually doing your administrative work in the morning at your home office. I do this every morning. I start my morning with my administrative work. I go check my emails. I do all that good administrative work. And then I start, you know, in, in, into, into my day and doing things that I might, uh, and I might do them at my home office or I might have to go into a meeting at my uh, office at, at, uh, at work. Now, here's another thing people will say, well, tax preparers will say, well, you can't have two offices. That's not true. Okay. Now there's very specific rules and you need to sit down with a tax advisor to really understand what those rules are, but you can make what's important for your home office is that it's your primary office. Okay, it has to be your primary office and there are very specific requirements that you need to talk about with your accountant um, to know what those, those are because they're very, very specific and they're going to be different for every different situation. So I'm not going to talk about them here. But the, the key is you can have, for example, my office at um, uh, my CPA firm, um, I go there only for meetings. That's the only time I use it. I, the rest of the time I'm in my home office. Okay, so my home office is by is very clearly my primary office. Okay, it's very clearly my primary office. So I always start first thing in the morning. I do my administrative work. I may then go. I may then go to the office for meetings. I might go see clients. I might go see some real estate that I have, and then I come back at the end of the day. I'm going to come back to my home office. I'm going to clean up, you know, at my home office for the rest of the day. Well, what that does is now now the car right, has a much bigger percentage of business use. And remember, your car is only deductible to the extent of your business use. So if you can shift your business use, let's say you buy, a, and, and here's going to buy, here's going to be your strategy number four, which is where I, you'll see that these are all connected. These strategies all get connected is bonus depreciation. So we, we now, let's say you go buy a $80,000 SUV. And it weighs at least 6,000 pounds because that's what it has to weigh. Well, now, okay, now you have a home office. Okay, well, that, instead of being 50%, now you're 90% business use. 90% of that $80,000 or $72,000 is now subject to bonus depreciation, which means you get to deduct $72,000 the year you buy it. So because you have a home office, so if you were, let's say you were, didn't have a home office and you were less than 50%, you don't even get bonus depreciation. But now you're more than 50%, you're now 90%, and you're going to get bonus depreciation because you have a home office. So, you know, for all of those accountants out there that say home office is a waste of time and you just don't get very much, I'm going to say, look, $72,000 for most of us would be a pretty nice deduction to have and would wipe out an awful lot of income um, at, at a 30 or 40% tax bracket. That's a huge, huge number. And that automobile expense is there because you have a home office. So it's not a home office deduction. It's an automobile expense deduction, but that's a, it's a big deal. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because when bonus depreciation came out, there was, a, you remember I called you last year, there was actually a scenario in which I could get rid of my existing Range Rover and buy a brand new one and come out on top. Right. But, you know, we talked about some of the rules around that and, and, and all of this. But if you understand the rules and if you connect all the pieces together, there's actually some really great benefits that you can achieve. Um, and, and you're right. I've, I've actually I have really seen the bonus depreciation and what it's done. Um, I want to come back then uh, since we talked about the home office and that connected to number four, which was how that in, uh, we'll talk about bonus depreciation, and what that means in a second. But should we talk about the uh, number three, which was never have a schedule C? So how, how you own your business is really, really important um, re regarding how much tax you pay. Okay. Most, um, 
my my buddy um, Garrett Sutton, who's a asset protection lawyer, he says he says CPA stands for cannot protect assets, and uh, <laughs> because he gets very frustrated because CPAs will say, oh, you don't need an LLC or you don't need a corporation because you know that's just a waste of money and a waste of time and all that kind of stuff. And I'm going, but wait a minute, you want to protect your assets. On top of that, if you have a limited liability company, you can elect to tax that limited liability company any way you want. So you could have a limited liability company that provides great asset protection and you can tax it as an S corporation or you can tax it as a C corporation. You can tax it as a partnership. You, you really get your choice on how you tax that. So having that LLC is gonna be a really important thing. But if you have the LLC and you don't make any election and you're the sole owner of your business, you're gonna be back on a schedule C. So the fact of having that LLC is not enough. So Tom, what okay. is a Schedule C? If you're a sole, if you're a sole proprietor, you're an entrepreneur, you own the business yourself, and you just went out and set up a bank account, basically. That's what you did. You set up a bank account, Onyx Single, DBA, um, uh, you know, I like coffee. Okay. And 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 so you you set up this I like coffee franchise. And you start operating on under your personal name, or you do an LLC and you set up the LLC, limited liability company, and you own it one hundred percent. And now it's uh, I like coffee LLC. And now what you do is now when you report your income and expenses, instead of reporting them on a separate tax return, you're going to report them on your personal tax return. Which I hate putting stuff that I don't want people to know on my personal tax return because we give it to banks and all sorts of other people. Um, but a Schedule C basically is how you report that business. Now, why doesn't the IRS like Schedule C? Well, it's really simple. You think about your financial statements, okay? So if you're an entrepreneur, you, sh you really should be focused on three different financial statements. Your income statement, your, which is your amount of income you co that comes in and your expenses going out, your balance sheet, which is your assets, liabilities, and then what's left over, which is your net worth, and your statement of cash flow, okay? Now, a Schedule C is basically your income statement, and that's it. <clears throat> well, a Schedule C is really easy to manipulate because there's no, there's only one side of, you know, we have what we call double entry accounting, which means you have two sides of every entry. You have a debit and a credit, which I know that's just accountant speak, but what it really means is, is that it balances all the time. But a lot of times, the other side of that, let's say you have cash coming out of your bank account and on an expense, okay? So one side is the cash coming out. The other side is the actual expense. Well, your Schedule C, all it shows is the expense. It doesn't show the cash coming out. That's a balance sheet item. So it doesn't show both sides of the transaction. It only shows one side of the transaction. Well, if you think about it and you go, okay, how do you know you've got a straight line? Because you got two points and there's a line in between those two points. And so now you got a, you got a line going through it, okay? Now, let's say you take one of those points away. Now you put all the lines you want through that. So, you, so the IRS doesn't know if you're telling the truth or not. And so they believe you're probably not telling the truth. That's, that's really, they don't believe a thing is, remember, under the tax law, you are guilty until proven innocent. And there's actually good reason for that. It's from a, and I know this isn't policy time, but from a policy standpoint, look, not, the, the tax law says no expense is deductible unless we say it is. That means you have to prove it's deductible. Okay, and all income is taxable unless we say it isn't. So if you have tax income that you say is not taxable, you have to prove it's not taxable. Well, that okay. Now that makes sense, right? So on a on a on an income statement only, you have one side of a transaction. How do you prove that that's accurate? Well, that's a tough thing to prove to the IRS. And the problem is with the Schedule C, you're only showing one side, so they don't they they don't believe you basically. They're just not going to believe that that's accurate. And they're going to come in and audit you and make sure that you're doing that accurately. Let's say instead, and this is something that all entrepreneurs, this is just basically entrepreneur 101, right? 
from, from a tax standpoint. You, instead of being a Schedule C, most entrepreneurs should probably just be an S corporation. And an S corporation, you can still be a limited liability company from a legal standpoint, still get that asset protection, but you make an election. And what it does, it does two things. Most importantly, it gives you a separate tax return for your business. And that separate tax return is called an S corporation tax return. It's 1120 S. And it's completely off of your personal tax return. Now, the number comes back into your tax return, okay, because you're taxed on it, not the corporation. But again, it's a separate tax return. Well, that tax return has both an income statement and a balance sheet. So now the IRS is much better belief that you're doing it right because you're showing them both sides of your transactions. And I know that's a lot of accountant speak, but all you have to remember is don't do a Schedule C, do an S corporation. And if you get those two things, and here's the thing. So on an S corporation, remember on a Schedule C, you have to report that you have a home office. On an S corporation, what you do is, according to the IRS, you just reimburse yourself for the home office expense from the corporation. It's not taxable to you. It shows up on your tax return for your S corporation as office expense. There is no separate form to show that you have a home office. So the only way the IRS would ever know you have a home office is if you got audited. So it can't possibly create an audit because the IRS doesn't even know you have a home office until they audit you. So it, it's a, it, if, if you're being told that don't take a home office because it's a red flag, it's only a red flag because you didn't do the other thing that's important, which is to not be a Schedule C, to go out and do an S corporation. See, and, and the point is, Onik, is that these things all work together, right? So now you got your automobile expense, your home office, your, your um, uh, not being audited. All of those things come about because you know, all in the same, you know, all because you're working together. Um, so before we move on to talk about bonus depreciation for a couple minutes, I, I, I can already feel it. I can sense that our listeners are thinking, what the heck? I want to talk to someone. How do I do this? What do I do? Oh my God, I'm not doing this because we're only at three and a half. Like we haven't finished number four. So I never do this for people usually, but I'm going to do this now. Um, the URL to go to, if you want to schedule a free call to talk to a tax advisor that is a part of Tom's inner network, these are the best of the best around the country, go to Wealth Ability. Okay, Wealth, W E A L T H, Ability, A B I L I T Y.com, WealthAbility.com. You'll have a, uh, a little button there. You click, you schedule a call, and you'll be talking to someone uh, who's Almost as smart as Tom, maybe you know, definitely not as smart, but it's pretty damn close. Oh uh, no, there, there, there's a lot of people smarter than me, pal. So, oh, well, then I want to talk to them too. <laughs> we, do, we do. We have. We have. We do have an entire network of um, accountants and CPAs that yeah. uh, have joined our network, so that you know, I get, I get to train them. Yeah, and, and so, I want to. Actually, a lot of fun. I do want to warn everyone who's thinking about going into this. First of all, a great accountant, there's going to be a cost to it. So please, you know, going to get on a free call. Eventually, you have to engage their services if you want the help right. that comes with it. Uh, the first time I ever called Tom, uh, he was advised. I was I was recommended to call him by, by Robert Kiyosaki's team, right? So I called him right away, and then we talked, and then, you know, he told me how much his advice would cost, and I almost fell off my chair. Um, I was completely in shock. I thought, wow. But within like three months of doing it, it's like if if I asked you for a dollar and every time you gave me a dollar, I gave you seven back or 10 back or 20 back, how many times would you do that transaction with me? So it's like, that's how it's so a lot of people I find what they do with account. And this is what I did. Uh, guilty. Okay. I went to my neighborhood accountant down the street. This is someone I knew since I was a child. I mean, he was, a, he's a good person. I love him. I still know him, but he's an accountant for local small, like he's an accountant, good accountant for employees with a little bit of a twist in their taxes, you know, a local doctor's office or whatever. I had gone way past his abilities, but um, a lot of people try to, they discount shop thinking that all accountants are the exact same. And I'm just here uh, this is not, Tom's not asked me to say this. I'm telling you is one of the biggest lessons I learned as an entrepreneur is don't, there's one place you don't discount shop is with your CPAs, with your lawyers and with your wealth managers. You, you just, you do not discount shop those people because, uh, well, you get what you pay for. So 
Um, all right, Tom, uh, bonus depreciation. Uh, my understanding of it is the ability for us to deduct a whole crap load of something we buy for the business in year one. It way it used to be up until recently was over time. So the so if you spent a hundred grand, you know you could depreciate it over so much time. But now it's like a large portion of that goes boom right in the first year. Is that kind of a correct summary? I think that's a great way to put it. It's uh, you know <clears throat> we used to have. You know, we think of it as a net income tax. It's actually a consumption tax now because um, it, it's only the amount that you actually consume that is taxable. So if you don't consume it, if you actually put it back into the business, you're going to get a deduction for it. And it doesn't matter anymore. It used to matter whether that what the money what the money was spent on. Was it spent on a, a, an expense that was, you know, you're going to use in the next um, five days or is it deduct, was it spent on, money, on something that you're going to use over the next five years? Now something you're going to use over the next five years gets just as much of a deduction as something you're going to use over the next five days. So whether you spend it on, you know, um, uh, you know, that meal that we're talking about that you're going to use immediately or whether, you, or whether you spend it on a car, which you're going to use over the next five years, doesn't matter. You spend it on equipment. Um, that the microphone you're talking into, that's deductible. You know, the desk that you have, that's deductible. And <clears throat> what's really interesting is they um, changed the bonus depreciation rules. Not only is it now 100% deductible the first year, but even used equipment is deductible the first year. So it doesn't have to be brand new. It used to have to be brand new. And, we, and then we have this whole 179. A lot of people have heard of 179. We don't even bother with 179 anymore because bonus depreciation is so much better than um, this section 179 deduction. So um, for the next few years, at least until 2023, we have bonus depreciation at 100%. So that means that anything you put into your business, you can, you know, a, a lot of your, let's say you remodel your office, a lot of that is going to be deductible. Not all of it, but a lot of it's going to be deductible. You could go buy, Anik, you were saying that you were down at Brad Summerock's event and you're looking at multifamily housing. Well, multifamily housing, normally that's used property, right? You're not going to go build your a, a brand new apartment building. So you're going to, you're going to take, well, when you buy a piece of property, you're actually buying four different things. You're buying the land and the building, but you're also buying the land improvements, all the landscaping, the outdoor lighting, the um, the infrastructure, all of that kind of stuff, and you're buying the contents of the building. Well, the contents of the building and the land improvements are all subject to bonus depreciation. So let's say you buy a million dollar building. This math is phenomenal. You buy a million dollar building. You put down $250,000 on a million dollar building. You're not gonna put down more than 250,000, okay? So you invest 250,000. Your first year deduction is going to be somewhere between two hundred fifty and three hundred thousand dollars on that two hundred fifty thousand dollar investment. It's kind of like a free building. It, it is. It's like I'm getting this huge deduction for something that's going to last for the next forty years. That is a screaming deal, okay? And so you know, I'm not here to say I don't want to pay taxes or I do want to pay taxes. I'm just telling you that. If you understand the tax law, there, for an entrepreneur, there's no reason to be paying high taxes. It's just, you're just not understanding the tax law if you're paying high taxes. And it's funny, right? Because last year, 2018 was the year I built the Learn Center. So we invested a ton of money in video equipment, AV equipment, desks, and I don't know what else what we did. And there was a conversation happening at the end of last year because we got to figure out like, okay, any tax strategies needed in 2018 to eliminate taxes. I remember I called Tom and he was like, you don't need, like, we don't even need to talk. I'm like, why? He's like, because there's no way you're paying taxes with bonus depreciation. And the fact that you just built this center with all the stuff you bought. I mean, there's going to be carry forward probably losses because it's just the way that. So, and you know what? That was helpful 
it was super helpful, it gave me more net income at the end to be able to continue to invest in the center. And it encouraged me to freaking build this place. Like it, it is actually helpful. In the example Tom gave of buying the building, someone might say, that's ridiculous. You, you write off the whole thing, a rich person who has a million, you know, who has that much money to even buy that. Well, you just bought a building that maybe has 10, 20, 30 units. You're providing housing for people. That's going to increase the real estate taxes. It's going to increase the value of the area, the economy of the area. Like, that's far, far more impact than a one-time tax you would have paid for for the building. So, uh, but anyways, we're we're let's move along, Tom, because um, we're getting a little bit behind. But it's been awesome. I just I, I don't know. Every time I don't like taxes, but every time I talk to you, you talk about saving taxes, and all of a sudden I like taxes. So, um, I like talking taxes. Number five. Number five. What's what's? Uh, all right. Well, let's do a cool one. This, this one's kind of fun. I actually gotten a little play out of this recently. Um, so let's say uh, every once in a while you go on a two-week vacation, and while you're on that two-week vacation, you put your house on Airbnb. The income that you get from Airbnb is not taxable. Wow. If you, if you lease your house for 14 days or less, for 14 days or less, you rent it out for 14 days or less during the year, the income is not taxable to you. So, so let's say, I mean, for example, that this is actually came about because of the Olympics, right? The, the Olympics would come to a city. Um, I came to my hometown, Salt Lake City, a few years ago, and uh, people would just leave town. They say, look, I'm going to leave town. I'm going to rent my house out for the two weeks of the Olympics. And they might rent it out for $1,000 or $2,000 a day. So let's say you rent out for $2,000 a day for 14 days. That's $28,000 non-taxable income, tax-free income that you can just put in your pocket. So, so um, just so you know, you can actually rent it to your company. So you might use your home for business purposes. Um, you might rent out, use the whole, the entire house. You might decide you want to bring uh, your key employees in and you kick your spouse out and kick your kids out and say, go somewhere else. And, uh, and, and then you just use, you, you might use your house or you might have a vacation home that, you know what, normally you just don't want to rent it out. You don't want to do anything, but for 14 days a year, you're going to rent it out and not pay tax on that income. There's just all sorts of things you can do with this. Um, I actually recently got invited to speak at an Airbnb conference um, just because this is such a cool tax benefit. It's, it wasn't ever intended for Airbnb, but <laughs> because it came out, it came came out long before Airbnb was around. But now a lot more people can use it because you know you you just you know you go on vacation and why let your house sit vacant? Why not Airbnb it? Wow. Awesome. Well, there you go. Everyone, he just put an extra, you know, a few thousand to ten thousand dollars in your pocket if you're willing to go with it. That's 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 really cool. Uh, all right, number six. So so far we are. This is awesome. We're lots of money. We're, we're back halfway back. through here. Yeah. All right. So number six is travel. So um, again, we go back to the the basic rules. Okay. Can you make your travel a business purpose? Can you make your travel ordinary and necessary? Okay, well, let's think. What are you going to do while you travel? Well, if you were going to just go out and have a pure vacation, I mean, I just spent five days at Lake Powell with my kids. That was pure vacation. I mean, there was no business purpose there. I just wanted to have fun on the lake with my kids. Great. But let's say that you go, no, you know what? I'm going to go and let's say that you're going to, you're a real estate investor. I'm going to go look at real estate. All I have to do, is spend four and a half hours a day during the week during the weekdays doing business four and a half hours, and then the primary purpose of the trip is business because it's four and a half out of eight hours is more than fifty percent. So that means the rest of the time during the day I can do whatever I want. The weekends I can do whatever I want. So I take a two week trip. I only have to work basically 40, 45 hours. I mean, you think about it, I'm working 10 days, four and a half hours a day. I'm going to work 45 hours in two weeks. And if I can work 45 hours in two weeks, then the rest of the time, the whole thing is deductible. So it's an all or nothing. Okay, so that we can you can make a lot of your travel deductible simply by 
having a real business purpose and, you know, go see clients, go see, you know, go see prospective clients. You know, if you're in business, go, go learn something. I mean, you were in Dallas, right? For the last, last weekend, right? And when you're in Dallas, you're in Dallas and, and you're learning something, you're, you are doing business, you're doing something good, but you, I hope you had fun in Dallas too, right? I mean, in the evening, right? You had, you had some fun you went and saw some things. You might have go see a show, whatever. You can do all that and still all deductible. So a lot of people don't deduct travel just because they don't know how to deduct travel. So I have a question. Um, so this is interesting because like right soon I'm going to be going to, uh, I went to Toronto recently twice and that was for business. I went there to speak at an event, ended up staying an extra day or two, had business meetings with the people who had arranged the events. Soon I'm going to be speaking in Singapore, Malaysia. Uh, I'll be there for a while because I have to do multiple events. So that all becomes fairly easy to understand how that's a business uh, travel business. Let's say I'm going to Switzerland. Okay. I don't have any clients there. I don't have any contacts there. Does the four and a half hours a day of work have to be location dependent? Like I have to be doing something. Like, there has to be a reason for me to be in Switzerland. Right. And, and it actually, when you travel internationally, it's proportionate. It's not all or nothing. So, so if you spend 50% of your time doing business, then 50% of the trip is deductible. So foreign travel is a little different than domestic travel. But let's say, for example, let's take Switzerland, because I think that's a great one. Okay, let's say you decide that you're going to go interview some bankers. You're going to talk about what are you going to do with your money? Well, how are you going to, how are you going to set up your offshore accounts? You're going to, so all, you can do, let's say you're going to do tax planning in Switzerland, okay, which is legitimate tax planning, right? And you spend your time doing tax planning for your business in Switzerland, Okay, now all of a sudden that's that part of the that part of the trip is deductible. So be, because that's part of your business, right? Part of your business, and or let's say you're investigating. A good one for you is you're investigating how to do this for uh, for all of your 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 um, viewers, right? You're, you're looking at all of your members, all of your viewers, and going, this is how you do it. So you go and investigate something. I mean, here's the thing about entrepreneurs. We're all about coming up with new ideas and exploring new ways to do things. Why not? I, I, what, what's better than doing it in a foreign country and actually learning from that country? Because they have a completely different way of looking at things than, than, than we do in the U.S., right? So if I go to, for example, I was in um, Bucharest, uh, Romania. I'm going, and I was actually speaking there. So that was an easy one, right? Like you say, sometimes it's easy. But I'll tell you what, I learned so much. They have a completely different way of looking at business, a completely different way of doing things. And so there's so much you can learn only by being there. So I would look at it. So this is why I say, when you look at, at the tax line, you go, I'm going to do what the tax law tells me to do. You will make more money because you have to do things that make you money in order to make to get the deductions. And so to me, it's, a, it's a, like, I, lo I love what you say. It's a win, 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 right? Because you're helping the economy, okay? At the same time, you're helping your students. At the same time, you're actually making more money and reducing taxes. So you've got all sorts of good things going on because you're doing what the tax law tells you to do. Oh, that's awesome. Love it. Yeah, I love it. Tra travel and getting travel deducted, if you're if you're listening, is one of my absolute favorites because um, my wife loves to travel. We like to take vacations. It's usually a good opportunity to take a break, but I'm an entrepreneur. So the thing is, when I travel, I know I'm going to be working. So if there's a way to kind of fuse the two together and be able to deduct all of that away from income, that's that let the government pay for some of my fun too. Um, it's great. Uh, love it, Tom. All right, let's move on to number number seven. So let, let's talk a little bit about documentation and um, because this is actually a big one that it's not sexy, it's not exciting, but I'll tell you what, it will, it will make the difference between having a positive experience with the IRS and your accountant or a negative experience. First of all, when you have, and what I mean by this is you hire a bookkeeper, okay? You hire a bookkeeper who is not your spouse and who is not related to you and can hold you accountable, because that bookkeeper, you want to make sure that they're a professional bookkeeper. Bookkeeping, it's not a very expensive service, okay? It's not very expensive. 
But having that documentation and somebody who will really make sure that you're documented, that you're, you've got things in place, that everything ties out, let me tell you what it'll do for you. First of all, you're never going to have to worry about an IRS audit because you're going to have all the documentation that you need. Okay. Number two is when it comes time to do your taxes at the end of the year, it's going to be half as expensive. Okay. Because you're going to turn over a really nice set of books to your accountant and your accountant's going to say, wow, this is great. This is not going to be very expensive at all. Because most of the time we spend on doing tax returns is spent doing bookkeeping. Uh, I'll tell you, that's, there's no question. Most of the time we spend is doing bookkeeping. It reminds me of, um, I think, uh, Karen, what's your partner's name again real quick? I yeah, Karen. Karen, right? Karen. Yeah. Uh, how much she loves working with my dad. And even you, oh, yeah. even you've said, you've said in the past, cause my dad does a lot of my, like, you know, not my main company, not learn, but he does a lot of my other companies and he does the bookkeeping. And every time, like, I, I know that she would work with him. She's like, I love working with him because he gets me everything I need. Like in a, in a, he's in a all over it. Yeah. And, and he's an unusual one. You know, most of the time I say, don't, you know, don't hire a relative. Um, I, I would say your dad is a, kind of the exception that proves the rule uh, he, type of guy. He keeps me. He's like all over it. He keeps me in check. I'll tell you, there's only one person who can get me to respond to a text and answer questions that fast. It's him because he doesn't let it go. Um, and he doesn't forget stuff, which is, uh, I guess it's the uh, engineer in him. But yeah, it's um, he's very meticulous. And, and thanks to that, it allows me to be um, it allows me to be in accordance with everything. You know, we have um, Milena now at Learn and uh, she tracked, she chased, she chased me down. You know, you can't just put an Amazon charge on our credit card and say it's deductible. She says, can I get the receipt? What was it that you bought on right. Amazon? And exactly. by, you know, by doing that's made me more aware because all of a sudden some of my supplements are, you know, not showing up on my business credit card anymore. <laughs> I'm pulling them off because I don't want, uh, Milena's going to come at me later and be like, why is vitamin C on the, you know, learn credit card? So it's like, yeah, I, it, it makes me be more aware. And, and you're right. It just makes everyone's lives easier. And you know what? I can honestly say, everyone, I walk around every day with very little fear of an audit. Um, as a matter of fact, at Learn, we actually are doing a voluntary audit with a private company because we we just wanted to make sure we have all our ducks in a row. But I don't, I don't really walk around with a lot of fear of it. If they came in, all right, waste your time because in the end, they're going to find I'm pretty much up to speed on everything and I've got everything done right. So you talk about documentation, how much it saves money. I just want to talk to all the entrepreneurs out there. Proper documentation gives you a uh, good sleep at night because you, you know, now I hate, by the way, this is a funny joke. It's, it's a true story. I hate receipts. I don't know what it is with receipts. I have a deep innate hatred for them. I hate being handed receipts. I hate shoving them in my wallet. And, um, there was an ep you know, when I first watched uh, Iron Man, it was a really funny scene where someone's trying to hand him something and he puts his hands up and he goes, I don't, I don't like to be handed things. So like he makes his assistant, He's like, give it to her. And I am the exact same way with receipts. Like if I'm at the grocery store and they're handing me a receipt, I'm like, I could give it to my wife. Like, I don't, I don't like receipts, but that part of me has begun to change. I, I'm, I, I really am trying hard now. Um, luckily also I buy most things online. So the receipts come into my email, but, um, entrepreneur, every entrepreneur I know, every entrepreneur I know is not good at documentation. I could be better but they're not that good. And you've since day one, Tom, you have driven this home with us. Like we've got to get better about it. And, and you're right. It's not sexy at all, but it's important. I'll, I will definitely say um, any uh, Tom. So every receipt should be saved and like properly uh, filed and like hardcore. You know what? It, it, it's easy though. Just scan them. Just like, I mean, I'm a big believer that we do too much stuff ourselves as entrepreneurs, right? And we're, there's a lot of do-it-yourself going on where you have – get an assistant. Have somebody else do it for you. Get a bookkeeper. Get somebody else to do it for you and let them scan the receipts. Just all you have to do is give them the receipt. It's no big deal. Write, write what the purpose was for the expense and just hand it over. No big deal. Let them scan it. File it electronically. You don't want to keep them physically. That's a – they're going to fade anyway. So don't keep them physically. Just do a, a, a good scan and make sure all the information's on there. And then you don't even have to worry about it. Awesome. It's like, hey, it's sleep at night. Yeah, it, it, it does. I mean, we're actually, it's, it's crazy. I don't know how much money we spent, but uh, yeah, we spent multiple, multiple uh, five figures to get a voluntary audit done by a private uh, CPA firm. 
uh, here at Learn, and it's in the process, and we're doing it just so we could find any holes in documentation, and that's that's when we, you know, that's how I got myself to stop putting supplements on my company's credit card. Um, yeah. All right, number eight, let's do this. Okay, number eight. So here's another fun one. This is something that people don't think about. So our tax law system, like most countries, is what we call a progressive tax law, meaning that we all have low tax rates. We all have a zero tax rate. First $12,000 is non-taxable. Then we have a 10% tax rate. Then we have a 12% tax rate on up to, in the U.S., a 37% tax rate. That's how it works. And it's progressive, okay? Progressively, the more money you make, the higher the tax bracket. Well, here's the cool thing. So everybody gets the same tax brackets, meaning that our children have the same tax brackets we have. Our parents have the, our elderly parents have the same tax brackets we have. So a lot of entrepreneurs have children and they might be two or three or four or five or six or seven, doesn't matter, 12, whatever. And they've got, they've got, you've got an underutilized asset right there because they've got a tax bracket, a zero tax bracket that you're not using. And every year that zero tax bracket goes away. You had $12,000 you could have you could have had in a zero tax bracket that you didn't use, okay? And if you've got three kids, you've got three $12,000 tax brackets that you're not using. So here's what you have to do. You have to involve your kids in your business. You have to involve, this is a great opportunity for entrepreneurs because you think about it from, again, from a policy standpoint, does the government want you teaching your kids how to work? Obviously. Would they like them to not be on the welfare rolls when they get older? Obviously. Would they like them to contribute to society through business? Obviously. I mean, those are all positive things, right? And so what the government says is great. So if you pay your children to work for you, now, let's say that they're two, but let's say that your business requires some child modeling, okay? You could actually pay your kids to model. Now, pay them a reasonable modeling fee. Don't pay them $12,000 to do $500 worth of work, okay? Pay them $500 to do $500 worth of work. But child models are not cheap. So you can pay them a realistic modeling fee. Or let's say they're 10 or 12. Have them, have them start doing some bookkeeping for you. Have them do some work in your business. Have, get them involved. I started working at my dad's printing company when I was 12. Okay. He had, I was paying me a buck an hour. <laughs> he should have paid me more. It would have been better for him tax wise. But um, he, 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 pay, he did. I mean, we were all involved in the family business. And we all learned about business because we're involved in the family business. So there's a lot of benefits to involving your kids in your business. But one of the big tax benefits is that first $12,000 you pay them is deductible by your business at your 37% rate and non-taxable to them. So you just eliminated tax on $12,000 for every kid you do this. Now you say, well, I don't have children. Well, a lot of people... In uh, a lot of millennials have elderly parents, okay? You have, and you're taking care of your parents. So here's the thing. Parents, it's even easier because you don't even have to pay them. You can give them a share of your business, okay? You can't do that with your kids because the, they don't get uh, tax brackets for passive income, but your parents do. So you can actually give them a non-voting, non-controlling interest in your business and Again, let's say they're in a very low tax bracket because they're just on Social Security. Great. Give them, give them an interest so that, that some of that income is showing up on their tax return in their tax bracket instead of your tax bracket. So taking advantage of those tax brackets, it's a pretty big deal and very few people. And what, what's funny is, so I was in um, South Africa a couple of years ago. And I'm about to get on stage and we have the South African CPA um, with me. And I, I turned to her and I said, I said, okay, look, I want to talk about paying our, paying your kids. Can you do that here? And she looked at me, she goes, 
oh my heavens, I never thought about that. That's brilliant. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's not. This is simple stuff, okay? <laughs> it works in, actually, that one works in every country. It works in every single country. You can pay your kids to work in your business. That's so crazy. Um, I, I thought of a, like, so Jimmy, if you're listening, which you probably aren't, um, but uh, so Jimmy Kim, la last night we were talking about his daughter, um, Allie. She's super adorable and she's getting more and more adorable by the day. And I just told, I was joking with him. I said, hey, can you ship her over here and you make another one? Like, I'll take her. Um, and he goes, sure, no problem. Send her back when she's making money. And so Jimmy, she can make you money now. <laughs> like, just... Get her to do some photo shoots for Sendlane. That would be awesome. And then you can uh, divert income to her. That's so cool. Like if you're listening to this, um, there's just so many ways to deploy this. And it's your choice. $12,000 is is a lot of money, especially for entrepreneurs doing a couple hundred grand or whatever a year. And I mean, that, that's a... Uh, that's 5% and you got two or three kids that adds up real quick, real simple, real easy. Not to mention your kids are involved. They're learning. You're spending time with them. It's a cool little fun thing. Like when my nephew came here once, I keep always referring back to this. It was so fun. I don't have any kids, but my nephew was visiting and he loves the Learn Center. He says it's Disney World and um, he went and he wanted to speak on stage. I was completely baffled. And so I took like an hour and a half the night before, like, you know, working with him, teaching him. Um, and then the next day he got up on stage and he spoke and I just wish he lived closer by because if he did, how much fun could we have? Uh, he would definitely charge me though. He's a very capitalistic child. So I know that. But hey, but here, here's a cool thing. So your kids are minors, which means that they don't get to control that money. You do. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not going to hand them, you're not going to hand them $12,000. You're going to put it into a custodial bank account or a trust and you're going to be in control of it. And you're going to, you're going to decide what to do with it. The only thing you can't do is you can't do use it for support, right? You can't use it for food or clothing or housing, but you can use it for extracurricular activities. You can use it for family vacations. You can use it for um, music lessons, sports. You can use it for any of those things or, I don't know. Here's a thought. How about investing it for them? I was just going to say to your business. Okay. So they own a piece of your business or a piece of your real estate or whatever. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can teach your children about money by having this available to them. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Really, really awesome. All right. Um, let's, uh, let's do this. I, if you guys are getting ideas, I'm going to go give the URL again. If you want to talk about how this applies to your business with a live human being one-on-one, -on -one, go to wealthability.com, wealthability.com, and talk to one of the amazing advisors out there. They'll You can literally say, here's who I am. How will any of these and more, right? We're only doing 10 here. There's so many more strategies. There's so many things that Tom's done for me that we can't even talk about because they're just you know, they, they level up like as your income levels up and as it levels up, the strategies you can deploy level up. And so anyways, go to wealthability.com. All right. Number nine, Tom. Number nine. And, and this is a big one. Uh, it's, it's your tax preparation. Okay. Um, how do you report stuff on your tax return? Let me give you an example. So a lot of entrepreneurs spend a lot of time going to seminars and education and stuff like that. And the thing is, the IRS hates the word seminar. They think it's, that's personal. It's personal development. It's not really business. So what you don't want is you don't want to re have the word seminar or seminar fees on your tax return. Instead, that should be continuing education. Okay. Now, it is continuing education and it is a seminar. It's both. But you have to choose how you're going to report it. So how you report things on your tax return is going to make a big difference in whether you're audited and, and what that audit looks like. So this is, this is my point. Not all tax preparers are created equal. Okay. And just be really careful. And I don't care who you use. Just make sure that, they're, that you're understanding what they're doing on your tax return you don't want them cheating in any way. Do not cheat on your tax return. That is the worst thing you can possibly do. There's all these tax benefits. You have no need to cheat. But if you report things the right way, this is the, to honor your point about sleep at night, right? You've got to be able to sleep at night. And if, if you report things properly on your tax return, like you say, I mean, you're not afraid of being audited. Well, 
you know what, everything, uh, everything we do on your tax return, part, part of what we're doing is looking at how do we make sure that you're not going to be audited because we're the ones who have to defend that. We don't want to be defending your audit either. And, and so we just, you just be really careful with how you prepare that tax return. So like you said, you, you know, I, I'll go to this point is that you said, well, don't be, you know, don't be, um, uh, don't be cheap with your advisors, right? The way I look at it is you can, it, you can look at an advisor as an expense or an asset. And if you're, if your advisor is an, ex, it is an expense, in other words, you're not getting anything in return. It's just an expense. You want to lower the cost. But if your advisor is constantly giving you return, you actually want to invest more with your advisor because they're an asset. So what the, the big key in my mind is the big shift in thought process is let's have advisors that are assets and not, and not advisors that are expenses or liabilities. We want advisors who are assets. And when we have advisors who are assets, it's always going to make us more money, not cost us more money because the return on investment is always going to be so high. 100% true. Took me a little while to understand that, uh, but I could not agree more with you um, precisely why lately when I go to events um, and I meet someone who could help. My point is this, I might meet someone that's going to know a strategy at, that I don't, it's not going to like make or break me, but hey, it could make me or save me 50 grand and they're asking for 10. I mean, it's just a stupid transaction not to do it. Whereas the, the, the wrong thinking is people start focusing on the 10. Oh my God, it's 10, it's 10, it's 10. You got to focus on the 50 and the fact that you net 40. Uh, so uh, it, I know you're thinking, as I say this, people are hearing and going, well, duh. Mm, go back and think about your decision making. The duh applies to you. Trust me, because it did to me as well. Uh, Tom, number 10, we're at the last one here. What would you say? Okay, so we started out with uh, me having to uh, raise my right hand. So here's what we're going to do, Onyx. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me. All right. Ionic single. Ionic single. We'll never. We'll never. Speak to. Speak to. The IRS. The IRS. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> have zero desire. There you go. To. See, here's the thing. Um, your tax advisor will have a bigger impact on your finances than any other person in your life other than your spouse. Okay. What you don't want to do is be talking to the IRS because you will as an entrepreneur, you will screw it up. Okay. Here's the way, here's the way I look at it. You're going to play one-on-one -on -one basketball against a college basketball player. Okay. Now you're going to go up against that college basketball player. Who's, and you're going one-on-one, -on -one. who's going to win that game? College basketball Absolutely. player, right? All day long. Yeah. All day long. Let's say though, you could hire LeBron James to come in and substitute for you and play that college player one-on-one. -on -one. Now who's going to win? Me. Your, your team's going to win. So why would you ever put yourself in a position where you're going up against somebody who knows more than you do when you could put somebody in there who knows more than they do? Yeah. They, I mean, you think about the IRS. Now, I appreciate what they do. I think they have the, one of the hardest jobs in the world. Seriously, I would rather be a proctologist than an IRS agent. <laughs> it's, a, it's a much cleaner job. <laughs> Sorry, I've just never heard that <laughs> analogy. All right, that, that's definitely a visual there, Tom. There's definitely a visual. There's a visual for you. Well, you think about it. Okay, so you come out of college and you go, okay, I could go work for a CPA firm where I'm the hero every single day. I'm always saving taxes. Or I could go work for an agency, a governmental agency, where none of my clients like me. They don't want to hear from me and they never want to talk to me and they're probably going to be rude to me. Now, where's your top, where are your top, where's your top student, where are your top students going to go? They're going to go to the CPA firms. They're, your A students go to the CPA firms. Your B students go to the lower level, what I call national CPA firms, and then your C students end up at the IRS. Well, you get an opportunity to put an A student against a C student. Who's going to win that? Who, who's going to win that? Okay, your A student's going to win. So this is where, you know, I spent a lot of time with Mr. Kiyosaki. Bless his heart. And I love him. 
And he wrote a book uh, a, a few years ago called Why A Students Work for C Students and B Students Work for the Government. And um, <laughs> it's a pretty funny title. I just have a mental and, image of him saying it. Like he, could, he would say it, that. Yeah. You know, but here's the thing. There is a time when you do want A students working for you, right? Don't hire the B students. Don't hire the C students. Hire the A students. Because guess what? The tax law is complex. All the details are complex. You have to know the basics. We've gone over a lot of the basics this morning. You have to know the basics. Your, your CPA, though, needs to know the intricacies of the tax law because they're the ones going up against the IRS. You're never going to talk to the IRS. You get an IRS notice, you're going to send it to your CPA. That's what you're going to do. You're not even going to look at it. Just send it to your CPA. You, you, you get a, a, and If it's a brown envelope, you open it because that's a check, right? But if it's a white envelope, <laughs> you just say, you turn to your assistant and say, here, scan this over and send it over, send it over to Tom, send it over to my CPA because I want him to handle this um, situation. And then I'm going to get a power of attorney from you. And, you know, Anik, we have a power of attorney for you all the time, right? So that anytime there's an IRS issue, we can just call the IRS. I actually have a direct line in to the best people at the IRS that the average person can't get into them. It's actually called the Tax Practitioner's Hotline. So having that team, this is really strategy number 10, and I think this is the most important part, is having a team of advisors that really have your best interest in mind. That, By the way, that you can send them a text at 6 in the morning. You can send them a text at 9 at night, and you are going to get a response. Okay, having those advisors that really understand their specialty, I mean, I'm a specialist. There's no question. I specialize in tax law. Don't be asking me asset protection questions. I, I have a general idea of it, but I'm not a specialist. That's, that's, a, that's a lawyer who's going to handle that. You know, there's a lot of stuff I don't know, right? And by the way, if your accountant says that they know everything, you need to run, okay? Because they don't, okay? We need to keep learning all the time. But I just think that having great advisors, I mean, on it, let's face it, I mean, I've spent a lot of time with you as an advisor to me, right? I'm not a marketing guru. That's not my specialty, but I'm, in a, I'm a business owner, so therefore marketing is important. So what do I do? I go to the best. I go to Onyx Single and say, Onyx, how do we do this? How do we put this together? And so I, you know, I'm a big believer myself in using advisors, using other people who know more than I do. So I, I have to preach on this for a moment because it's made such an impact in my life. And I'm very blessed because, and and so I'm not sucking up here, and but for the fact that I have Tom, I want to give everybody like the series of events and how crazy and what, why it's not even the fact that he saves me money. All right. So you guys, if you've been following the fighting entrepreneur podcast for a while, you'll remember I had Michael Kerrigan, who's my attorney and he was on. And so he's our general counsel, right? He's, he's the first person I go to for pretty much any matter. And then if I need a specialist, he points me the way. And he was on, he actually flew down here. And I, at the time that he was here, I told you I was looking for a very, very specialized type of person to ask a very specialized question. I Googled my brain off. I called people I could not find. I asked him and he worked three days and goes and gets me the only person out of, there's probably five people in the country I could have talked to. And he got me one of them, right? And, and it's because of his experience. Now, why did he have those doors? It's 25, 30 years of meeting people, knocking down doors, shaking hands. But him and I have built a relationship. It's, a, it's beyond the professional, you're my lawyer. He's been here at the Learn Center. He was at the grand opening. He, was, he flew down here to do the podcast episode. We've talked, we've had lunch. We've talked about his kids, my future plans. And so when I call him, it's not just a client. I'm not just a paycheck. It's like I'm Onik calling him and he cares. And in that episode, I talked about just how freaking pivotal that's been because I do. I've been in situations where I call him and I say, this guy needs to go down, do what you got to do. And he calls me three months later and says, check your bank account. There should be a $200,000 wire. It's gone. Right? Like how amazing is that? All right. Now, Tom, right? So many times I've messaged Tom, like, should I buy this car or not? Right. I don't even know if I'm really supposed to be texting him those things, but God bless him. He's nice and he always just responds. Um, but I've had him involved in some smaller details, but I've had him involved in big things, huge things. I'm building a three point six million dollar learn center. Should I? 
Is it a good idea? Is it going to cost me a ton of money? Is there a tax savings there? Um, I'm thinking about investing money in XYZ. Should I? And I that recently happened two weeks ago. Hey, Tom, I think I'm, I'm going to invest in this. What, what do you think? Uh, don't do that. Why? You should do this. Why? Because of the following 19 reasons. Oh, hey, but where do I learn this? Do you know someone? Yeah, actually, go to this event. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm at the event. I'm sitting. Here's the thing. I got massive ADD. I can't listen for a lot. I don't know how my own students sit through my events. I have freaking no clue. Like I'm sitting in the event. And and so Brad Sumrock, if you're listening, is I mean this with like the warmest of hearts. I'm sitting in the event like three hours in and I'm like, I'm going to shoot myself. Like I can't sit in one place. Like, can I pace? Can I run around? Where's my laptop? There's no internet in the room, which was damn smart because I wouldn't have paid attention. And my wife's loving it, by the way. She's taking notes and she's paying attention. I'm like, I can't. And that was when I sent you a text. Do you remember, Tom? And I said, hey, he's going to sell me something. Yes or no? So Brad's going to do a two-day event to convince me to buy something from him. And I don't care. I sent a 10-word message to Tom. Yes or no? And Tom's message back made me feel yes. So at that point, I'm looking at my wife and I'm like, do you think Brad would mind if I just walk up to him and be like, here's my credit card now. Like, can I leave? <laughs> like, I just want to buy what you're selling. But that's the level of confidence I'm able to move around in. Whenever I want to do something financial, I turn to my team. Right. And if I don't have someone in my team, I turn to my team and say, I need someone in my team. And it's made decision making in my life. And you know what? I've come to learn. And Tom, you can agree or disagree. This is why the rich get richer. Oh, no question. The, 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 the challenge that most entrepreneurs have is we're, we're just caught up in this do-it-yourself, right? If I'm going to get something done right, I'm going to do it myself. Well, that's, that's so stupid. If I'm going to get something done right, I'm going to hire the, per, the person who knows how to do it the best in order to get it done right. I'm building a, a guest house right now with a studio, and I'm going, I don't know how to do this. So I've got, Anik, you know, you know my, my, my uh, technology guy, Clint. And he's in there actually building the studio for me, working with my builder. And then I got Irene, my assistant over here, and she's making sure everything gets handled. And, I, you know, the builder's got all these people working for him. They've got the, the, she, the sheetrock people, and then they've got the, the, uh, the roof people, and they've got the framing people and all these kind of stuff. You don't do it by yourself. You don't, you don't build a house by yourself. You don't build a business by yourself. And, and frequently, you always hear it's loneliest at the top. Well, that's why you have advisors, because it is lonely at the top. There are certain things you cannot ask your staff, okay? You need somebody that you go, I'm going to ask somebody who knows more than I do about this subject, and that I know that I have a relationship with them, and, and it's not a relationship, it's not a top-down relationship, it's a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. And so I can ask Tom something that I could, might not be able to ask an employee, or I can ask my attorney something I could not ask an employee. And so then we can get really much better information. And, and then you also have that person to go rely on. Say, oh, hey, by the way, you need this contract done. So your attorney just says, oh, okay. I, and they know your business. And so it's just, you get bigger. The, this is why I say entrepreneurship is really a personal development journey. That's what it is. As we get bigger and we can handle more, we can trust other people to handle that stuff that we don't know how to do. And, and it's okay to say, I don't know. No, it's so true. And so I'm going to leave it at that, everybody. I challenge you, if you're an entrepreneur and you don't have, seriously, the first part of your wealth team, it was mine. The first part of my wealth team was Tom. It was, it was a great, great accountant because you got to do that first. And then you got the rest. So the more money you save, then you then you need someone who can help you invest it. And guess what? When you need that, you call your great accountant and say, I need help with this. Who can you recommend me to? And they'll have their network. So with that said, wealthability.com, wealthability.com. Schedule yourself to talk to one of Tom's most trusted people and figure out how they can work with you in a personal environment. 
And, you know, that's so much better than reading and strutting and trying to do it on your own. Get someone who knows their stuff. Let them do what they're good at. Pay them for it and make a heck of a lot more. Tom, thank you. Thank you so much for being here, man. It's always awesome talking to you. I always learn, even years after having had our relationship, I always learn. Um, the cool thing is I don't have to learn anymore because he just does it for me. So I, I just <laughs> I just get to sit back and listen. Uh, but, but what I love about you, Anik, is you're always learning. I mean, here you're, you're spending a weekend at a seminar and you're learning brand new stuff. And, you know, uh, we actually have a rule in our office that we don't take any client that doesn't want to learn. And uh, learning is a big part of what we do. And we are learning all the time. I mean, I'm learning new stuff every single day. You know, there's uh, the, the thing I've always loved about taxes is the more you know the more you realize you don't know and it's just an opportunity to learn all the time and and i appreciate you know our conversations on it because i'll tell you what you challenge me and i'm always learning so i i love it it's great thank you very much all right awesome well listen for everyone you've been watching come on you got to give tom some love he probably just made you tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars if you're watching on YouTube, go below right now, leave a comment. I'm sure he'll go check them out. Click subscribe, click the thumbs up icon and click the little bell icon. And if you're listening on iTunes, make sure you leave us a great review at iTunes or any of the other places that you listen to this podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Go to learn.com, L-U-R-N.com. Join the movement and become an empowering entrepreneur. Join the movement to help change the world. We'll do it all together. All right. And with that said, remember, as I always say, when life pushes you, stand straight, smile and push it the heck back. Till next time, signing off. Thanks for listening to The Fighting Entrepreneur with your host, Onyx Singal.